Today we're going to go and see a man about some Tamiyas. That's right, it's road trip day here on the channel. We're going to go and visit one of the UK's biggest Tamiya fans. He has a great channel. So let's get going because we've got an hour and 20 minute journey. Right, so I've just turned up. Let's head in and say hello. Well, well, well. Hi, welcome to Aussie Kicks. <laughs> I'll tell you what, it's about time. Yeah, welcome. Guys, we've come to see Gav uh, here at RC Kicks because I really need a lesson when it comes to Tamiya. And I tell you what, Gav, you have got some absolute beauties, mate. Yeah, I've been collecting a few vintage. Very cheap, though. They don't cost much money. That's what I tell the wife. <laughs> That's the best way, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so what is, I mean, look at, the, look at this collection you've got going on here. There are some proper beauties here. Yeah. I mean, this must have taken you years to, to get a collection like this, is it? No, no, not that long. Probably about, what, five years, I think. But I was lucky. I started collecting before the prices went insane. So you could pick up cars a lot cheaper than you can today. So starting a collection now is very expensive. Where I was lucky, uh, I managed to get a few key things before prices went stupid. So thank God for that. <laughs> so I think what we'll do is we'll stick the camera on a tripod. I'll come round and we'll run through some, some cool stuff today. There's a lot to see, there's a lot to do. So we'll crack on, shall we? Sounds good. <laughs> Well, it's nice to be here, Gab, anyway. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your channel, when you started it up, and uh, how things are going, really? Well, I started in February 2019. Okay, so a few years back now, then. Yeah, getting on a bit. Time flies, though. That's oh, it a does. scary thing. It really does. Uh, I was working full-time when I started the channel, and yeah. I really got into it just because I realised that Tammy were doing re-releases of old vintage stuff. And you love your vintage stuff, don't you? Yeah, yeah. and that's kind of where it's like, oh, because I, I didn't know that they were reissuing like, yeah. old stuff that I remember when I was like seven or eight and stuff. So that's where I was like, oh, great. So I, I, I got one, and then one, then I bought one for my son, and then it kind of started from there. Don't know where the YouTube thing came from. <laughs> it's it, a bit like me. I just sort of happened. Yeah. It's like one day it was like, there's an idea. I'll do that. And it was kind of a hobby. It was never going to be anything. And then I started doing a little bit. And then here we are, what, three, four years later. Yeah, four years now, yeah. And I'm... Um, a few more RCs than I'd planned. <laughs> Only just a few. <laughs> Give so a what was your sort of, like, obviously back in the day, Tamiya was the thing that you really loved. What was yeah. your first ever, a first ever Tamiya that got you into all this? Oh, it was a grasshopper. Grasshopper, yeah. Yeah, it was a grasshopper. Like most, it was like the gateway drug to RC. The way into it, yeah. yeah. And, and, and an affordable, affordable way as well, because... Well, that was the key. You know, at that time, things were quite quite expensive, and a lot of people that wanted to get into the hobby, you know, so, yeah. for some of them, it was way out, of, way out of their, you know, their reach. So the grasshopper was an affordable way into it, wasn't it? And that was like, obviously your first ever one, and then things just went from there, yeah? Yeah, I mean, I had the grass... I actually raced the grasshopper. Oh, you I raced think. it as well? Yeah. Okay. There yeah. was an, old, an older friend of mine who was properly into racing, and he was like, oh, come along. So I took my grasshopper racing. I must have been, I don't know, eight, nine. And he had a, he had a Schumacher cat. Yeah. So, you know, he's in racing on Schumacher cat four-wheel drive, and there's me with my grasshopper. But it was the experience, you know, I came, I was last and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's the experience, you had yeah. to experience it, and obviously you were young as well, and then you knew straight away that this this is what you wanted to get into, and that was a hobby for you, so... Yeah, exactly, that's and, where it came from. And things have just gradually progressed throughout the years then. Yeah, then I bought a, well, I got, got a Falcon for my birthday, and then I had that. That Again, that was a step up, but still very entry two-wheel drive. And I remember thinking, oh, I want to get a four-wheel drive. Mm. Like the Boomerang was uh, was the one that was out at the time. And it was just so expensive. And it's like, you used to go into the shops, the uh, BT's hobby shops. And, you know, Tamiya artwork's always beautiful. And I remember looking, thinking, oh, the hot shot. Oh, I'd never be able to afford a four-wheel drive one. And then you used to watch the little TV. Yeah, I was going to say, they used to have the video playing yeah. in the background, didn't they? You know, to... Yeah. To really get you going and yeah. you know that's what you wanted to I remember looking and they might as well have been a million pounds yeah yeah and then uh, i got the falcon which was a two-wheel drive step up and i had that but i broke it a few times and and then over time i slowly fizzled out and went on to other stuff but i remember flicking through the cat the, the catalogs and all the books and stuff and remember the cars of the day and that's the seed i think whereas now i i can i uh, what's available now and remembering then, and like, oh, I can have those, yeah, and yeah. that's kind of where it all kicked off it, from. It's all sort of come from from that, hasn't it? It's grown over the years. Your your interest for the hobby and for uh, yeah. Tamiya's as well. But I mean, looking around, it's not only Tamiya that you enjoy now, is it? There's obviously some other stuff as well. Just looking on the back there, we've got some team associated stuff, and we'll talk more about those as well in a moment, anyway. 
but I mean, you've got some very impressive cars here, you know, and for me coming down here today, so it's going to be a little bit of a lesson because, yeah. you know, I was born in the early 90s, you know, Tamiya was huge in the 80s, wasn't it, yeah. you know, and it was a bit before my time, you know, and for me and for people who watch my channel, and you've obviously seen it yourself as well, I do a lot of ready to run stuff yeah. and a lot of cheaper stuff as well. So coming down here today and, you know, experiencing and seeing a lot of these models that you've got on display here is a real, real treat for me because, um, I think you could definitely teach me a thing or two and I'm, I'm, I'm interested to get a much closer look at some of these, which again, we're going to do in a moment yeah. anyway. So it's a, it's a black hole, uh, that you can go into and it gets expensive real fast. I can imagine that's uh, but everything has a story. That's one thing that's really nice about uh, old vintage stuff is that you, like, I don't know a lot of these cars I didn't have when I was younger and I didn't know about them because they were just a whole different world. But as I've got back into kind of RC, I buy the car that I like the look of mm. and then you slowly learn the story unfolds and then viewers will contact me and say, Oh, do you know this? And, yeah. and you said this wrong and stuff. And you slowly learn all the little tiny nuances of each car of like, Oh, they're the correct tires. They're the correct uh, suspension. Cause a lot of them are racing buggies back in the day. So they were modified and changed. So trying to put them back to their standard sometimes takes a lot of effort. I bet it's quite hard trying to find all the little bits and you must spend a lot of time on eBay and Facebook Marketplace trying to track down all the little bits. And I can imagine a lot of the, you know, even the tires, for example, must be quite expensive, you know, trying to get certain bits. Finding the right ones, bits. The, yeah, the right ones. But luckily, a lot of the people that watch my stuff help me out no end. Like, yeah. I'll, I'll buy a, a second-hand car and it's missing a part. Mm, mm. So you think, how would I ever find this little part on a car that came out in 1989. Well, almost, like, impossible. almost impossible. Almost right? impossible, yeah. And then I'll post a comment in the Facebook group or anything like that, and it will be, uh, I've got one of those. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and things surface. So, yeah, I'm, I must admit that as the channel's grown, the people that watch my stuff have helped me out loads. And it happens more and more. You know, like someone will gift me an old car and it's missing certain parts. And then uh, other people will say, oh, I've got those parts mm. that are really hard to find. Yeah. And then I'll slowly put it back together again. And it's, it's handy having that, you know, you, you have got obviously 30,000 plus now, is it? 30, 31, over uh, 31,000 yeah. subscribers. It is a big fan base. And uh, it's nice to know you've got people out there who are supporting you and who can help you if you do need to find certain bits. Are you, restoring vintage stuff, yeah, the, you need help to do it. It's really difficult. You know, you can sit on eBay all day long, yeah. but there's no guarantee that that part will come out. But other people are like, oh, I've got that. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, and things come out of the woodwork all the time. Mm. So it's a, it's a godsend. It makes my life much easier. So I think what we'll do is we'll have a look at some of the cars then, because, uh, I mean, that's why I'm here, to be yeah. honest with you. I want to see some of your some of your rarest and, you know, some of the, your prized possessions, really. Okay. So uh, where would you like to start then, Gav? Because... Um, I'd like to shoot the dog first. You, I can hear the dog barking in the background. Yeah, we'll shoot the dog and then we'll move, we'll move on. Yeah, Charlie. Everyone. Yeah, in the beginning of my videos, usually I go hit it, Charlie. <laughs> hit it, Charlie. And no, one, it's my dog. <laughs> my dog is Charlie. He's my editor. He does the intro sequences to the videos, so it's a bit of an inside run. Hear him in the back. And he's now barking because every time I film to the camera. He starts barking. Drives me crazy. <laughs> the amount of cunts I've had to re talk, re reshoot stuff because of the dog. Yeah, it's the squirrel's fault. <laughs> Always. So I know I asked you to show me one of your rarest cars, and there are loads of them, to be fair, <laughs> which is why it's so difficult to pinpoint one. But you said this is quite special, Gavin. Why is this special? This is... Uh, all Tamiya fans will know this. This is a Porsche 959. This is a real icon for Tamiya when it came out, and... They haven't re-released it, so you can only buy these as originals now. And they're really fragile. The plastics have got really old, and the chassis... It's a 112 scale uh, car, but you can't really drive them anymore. They just implode. Uh, I restored this on the show. It's one of the very first ones. Luckily, I didn't pay the kind of money these demand these days. I paid a lot less for it. What would a good one of the... Like, a good, good condition... as You know, what would one of these fetch? <sighs> 800 ish oh, 800 uh, but if you wanted one new in box 13 1400 um it depends on condition and things like that these aren't the original wheels the original wheels are yellow but this was based on a real car that porsche made and raced in the paris dakar but these are actual alloy wheels that yep. uh someone made and these are the correct wheels for the the real car so the Tamiya ones are yellow but I've upgraded them to these ones. 
But then I sold the yellow wheels for this, and they sold for 130 quid just for a set of wheels and tyres. Um, but these are the correct ones that should have been on the car. Tammy had changed it. So what makes this so special, so sought after? You know, what, what is it about it? Why is it so unique? Um, the, the chassis. The chassis was only on two cars, this and a Toyota. Um, it was one of those cars that was really expensive when it came out, so a lot of youngsters really liked the look of it but couldn't really justify it. They are very fragile. The um, the body that's on this car was... a tech. When, when you make these polycarbonate bodies, you have limitations of moulding. Mm. And one of the problems is if you have a reach-round front and rear, you can't get it off the mould. So this was the first time Tamiya did something called blow moulding. Right, yeah. And when they produced the first ones, they were so fragile, they were breaking in the box. Not before you built it and run it, just disintegrating around the front. So Tamiya had to replace a load of these bodies for people that had bought them. So try getting a real one, original one. And I've got an original <laughs> one painted body uh, that, that came with it again. So it was all that, as well as it's a very beautiful looking, very it is. famous it livery. Is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why it's become so desirable. But also, Tammy have never re released it. And we're hoping for the 50th anniversary they will release it. But we're a bit worried that they will release it on a different chassis. Because right, okay. this chassis has fundamental design weaknesses yeah. in it. Yeah. But we don't want them to do that. We want it just as it is. Obviously, they can't do the livery because of the cigarette branding. Um, but still, we would like to see it just white. But hopefully we're all, you know, because a lot of people, uh, I've been lucky enough to be able to strip this down and rebuild it. So I've experienced building one of these, mm. whereas there's so many people that will never get the experience to build stuff. Yeah. Um, but I've never driven it because I can't because it will break. So I would love to drive this. And apparently they drive brilliantly. They're, they're, they've got a real powerful motor in them. They've got a, um, a technical motor in them that comes standard, which again is highly collectible on its own. So all these factors make it a really desirable, iconic car for all Tamiya fans. And, and, and you say they're going to they're gonna bring this back out, they're going to re-release this, are they? You, any idea sort of when? Or? We are, well, you don't we, know we yet. badger them constantly, and they do anniversaries, like they did the 45th anniversary mm. Porsche. This could be a 50th anniversary, but we are purely guessing. It's a guessing game, It yeah. would sell out instantly if they did it. Um, and it's it's just one of those cars that everybody would love to have. It's just an iconic Tamiya car. And I'm lucky that I didn't pay through the nose for it. And uh, I have one in the collection. Brilliant. I really like it. I'll tell you what has caught my eye. And it's something over there. Can we have a look at that? <laughs> the, the now, I have got a Hornet. But it doesn't look anything like that. No. So this is a June Watanabe Hornet. What is going on there? Because that is colourful. It's actually based on a trainer. Uh, Jun Watanabe is a Japanese designer, does clothes and all kinds of stuff, needed trainers. And I don't know where it all started, but he did this for Tamiya, and it only came out in Japan. It's the Jun Watanabe Hornet. Um, obviously, it's a very Marmite-looking thing. <laughs> it is. So a lot of people are like, oh my god, that thing's awful. And it didn't sell very well. And then um, it's had a resurgence and I've always wanted one, and I really like them, but they're so expensive now that if you want a new inbox one of these, you'll be paying £1,100 all day long. So they are difficult to get hold of. Again, the tyres and everything's a different colour. Even the manual was printed in purple. So everything <laughs> is different. So it's very hard to actually make one of these without getting all the actual correct parts. Um, I couldn't afford to buy one, so I built this out of parts that took me two years to find a bumper from one place, and, and I slowly built up my own one. Original was, that just, was that literally just a case of, you know, researching, trying to find all the bits and piecing it together then, really? Yeah, yeah. over time, finding the, right, the correct decals, the not aftermarket decals, the chassis, obviously everything's purple, so you've just got to hunt around for the purple bits. And then the tyres are really difficult to get hold of because they're only on this, the bumper... Everything that's purple is only ever on this car. So it was a tree here, a tree there. Uh, tires came up, bits and pieces. Um, and it's it's pretty much fully there, apart from the springs are not white. They okay, yeah. White. But and... I could spray them. Uh, I, and I keep an eye out even now that eventually some white springs will turn up. You haven't managed to. Come. You haven't managed to come across a set then. No, it's not difficult. yet. No, but it's. 
for all intents and purposes, it's it's a Jun Watanabe. And <laughs> considering what you can get a normal Hornet for... <laughs> yeah, you're, yeah, this is it. Uh, you know, it's like mine. I, I think I paid less than £100 for it. Yeah. And you consider how much that costs. Oh. You know, it's essentially the same thing as well, just different colour. It's the colours. Or various colours, yeah. yeah. And that's what makes it so so valuable is the the parts you can't getting a purple bumper you can get a black one all day long for oh yeah pounds, yeah yeah of course but try getting a purple one you know and the same with the tires and wheels and it was so unique that's what makes it so valuable now and now collectors have kind of grown into this expensive market and demanding more price you know prices are going up they've just become really collectible but at one point you could get these on bargain basement sale because no one wanted no them. one wanted them yeah, yeah. And there you go. Like you say, like Marmite, you know, it's a very unique colour scheme on there. Yeah. And to most people, you know, they'd probably go, oh, no, I don't want one of those. No. But when you know the story behind it and the history behind yeah. it. I mean, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. And since then, Jim Watanabe has done some other cars recently that he's uh, released with Tamiya. So the whole Blockhead, that's his company, has grown in popularity with the Wild One Blockhead. And we just had the uh, Hot Shot 2, which I've right. just done on, on the show. So it's become a big thing really yeah, yeah. so yeah but very impressive looking <laughs> it is a little bit yeah. <laughs> well there is there is something i want to know and that is would buying a tamiya as your first car in 2023 you know current day would it be a wise move you know a, a lot of people watch my channel and i do a lot of ready to run stuff a lot of cheap stuff as well there are cheap options when it comes to tamiya but would you recommend that that is a good way into the rc hobby it's a big question and it, I guess it will come down to, it depends what you want to get out of it and what you want to do with it. I do get a lot of people contacting me saying, what car should I get? Mm, and it's like, mm. well, it's like buying a real car. Yeah. It depends what you're doing with it. There are so many options. How can you possibly narrow it down to yeah. one? The, the, so it depends on your budget. There's no point, you know, it's like, oh, I've got a budget of £100. Well, get this car, it's £300. Well, again, so the budget dictates what you can get. Mm, mm. But luckily... These days, we have so much choice. There's yeah. so many cars. And it's not like all of one genre car is rubbish and one's really good. Mm. It does, it's not real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you've got to look at what you want to do with it. Do you want to play with it in the garden with your kids? And you've got kids that are like six, seven years old. Mm. Well, there's a whole range you can go to. You, you can, yes, there's the Tamiya Lunchbox, for instance. That's yeah. very cheap, fun. But then if you're looking for a bit more performance and control, mm. that's not really what you want. Or if you want to go with your friends to drive in the park that are older, you might want some buggies, for instance. Yeah. Well, that would be different. So do you want to build it? Can Do you have the time to invest in building? This is what I was going to say, because the good thing about a lot of the Tamiya is I know you can get the expertly built stuff as well, but a lot of it is in kit form. And the good thing about that, you know, you learn the car inside out, you know how to put it together, you know how to yeah. take it apart again. And that's obviously going to be a massive benefit for someone starting out. You know, it gives them that confidence to take the car apart, to repair it themselves and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. One thing, even when I get it ready to run and I break it, it's much harder to yeah. fix it when you haven't built it. Yeah. But people are very busy. They've got children. They've got lives yeah. to say, OK, well, you need to sit down and then put 10 hours into this and mm. then you need to paint the body people are going to go oh, i don't have that investment in it, it might be too much effort yeah. so then yeah. it doesn't it's not worth it you're better off spending that money on a ready to run you know and there's some brilliant ready to runs and budgets you don't have to spend 500 pounds no. on a racing buggy no. there is lots of brilliant buggies you can get ready to run now for 100 150 pound yeah so of course if you want to really it's to spend time with your children in yeah. the garden yep yeah. Going ready to run is probably a better way to go. If you like, enjoy building things and you want to give it a go, well, then you're going to get value from getting a kit. Mm. So, yeah, there's no hard and fast rules. And I think for some people, especially if they were around in the 80s and they enjoyed cars, you know, like the Hornet, the Grasshopper and all those sort of cars, back then, it's a way for them to relive their youth a little bit, you know, and it is a way for them to go back in time in a way. Very, very much so. I mean, yeah. if you remember cars from your childhood... Mm. There's nothing better than buying one that you remember and then building it up again. Yeah. Because it is exactly like you remember. Yeah. Like I, I built a Hornet I gave away on the show. And when I built it up, it was just like I remember it. Mm. And then I got a Grasshopper. Exactly. You know, these cars that are re-released are the same cars. They, they even use the same moulds. Yeah. 
So it's not like, oh, well, the stickers kind of resemble. It is the same car. Yeah, yeah. So that has a real value to it, which is what sucked me into it, mm. really. It's like, oh, I remember that car. I've got one. And then the experience. And they, they still are drivable. You know, they're still... Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, every time I've taken the Hornet out, I've enjoyed it. It yeah. might not be the smoothest thing, you know, the back end's bouncing yeah. around all over the place. But it's an enjoyable, it's an enjoyable car. Yeah. You know, and I think for me, I, every single time I've taken it out, I've always looked forward to taking it out again. But, you know, like you say, it's, it's going to be a good option for people. It might not be a good option for people. And again, on my channel, you know, I do a lot of cheap stuff. I do a lot of cheap ready-to-runs as well. And one of the questions people ask is, you know, what is the best cheap ready-to-run car to buy? And like you said, there really isn't one. You can't pinpoint one. But there are some great options out there. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's nice to know that there is some, some good options. And so if, if someone did sort of watch this video or they click over to your channel and they see all your amazing videos and they think, I want a Tamiya now, you know, what would you advise? What would you say, yes, start looking at this, go for one of these. What sort of options would you give to people if they really wanted a Tamiya to start out with, you know, in the hobby? Yeah, I mean, it depends if it's for you or it's for you and the kids. If it's you and the kids, get a lunchbox all day long. Yeah, I mean, they do look really fun, I have to say. They are. They, they are much better than the parts that make them. Mm. And they're a hard body, so painting them is really easy. You can use car paints, you know, you can do one colour, put the decals on and it looks really good. Very simple to build, so it doesn't take that long. And I, would mean, you I, say, I mean, would you say they're durable? Yeah, pretty much. Because, uh, again, that's another question a lot of people ask, you know, is this going to be durable? Is it going to hold up to the abuse that my kids are going to throw at it? All that sort of thing. It looks it. It looks durable. Yeah, I mean, my daughter's got a lunchbox and mm. she had it for her fifth birthday, I think it was. And, yeah, she... Holds the power down and just drives it straight into a wall. Because Kids do like light. doing that. My, my son yeah. enjoys doing that a lot of the time as well. <laughs> because they've got big tyres on them as well, it helps cushion everything. Yeah. So, you know, Tamiya's are not for bashing. Yeah. You know, if you want to jump them 30 foot in the air, no, don't, you know, I wouldn't go anywhere near the Kuroshos and, and Tamiya's and Schumacher's and stuff like that. Then you, you've got to buy a dedicated basher. Mm. If you want to go hard bashing, yeah. Yeah. you know. Um, but for driving around in the garden, jumping a little bit, that's a great place to Good start. Fun. But if you want to get it for yourself, I would say if, if it's a car you remember that you like, oh, I remember that. I always wanted that one. Get that one. Yeah. Because you will you will have a connection to it and it adds more interest yeah. and value to it. And then you lead on from that. So that would be my advice if you're looking at a Tamiya or Kyosho, if you remember, whatever. Definitely. But, you know, the, the WL Toy stuff, the, oh, I can never remember the numbers. What's the, the long wheelbase one that was brilliant? Oh, the, the, uh, the 124019, something it. like that. The 19, yeah, long that, wheelbase. I've got two of those. Yeah. Great little buggies. Great Ready little to run. Buggies. Great. Take it out of the box. Crazy fast. Really strong. No commitment to effort to do anything. Just take it out, charge it up, and off you go. Yeah. So, again, depends. I mean, they're not perfect out of the box. No. You know, that everybody knows who, who does the videos and reviews and stuff. A lot of the diffs can be you know they i think they have an allergy to grease over in china in the, in the, in the factory yeah. they don't like to grease their diffs and they're not perfect yeah. but they are an affordable way into the hobby and they like you say they are a good starting point for a lot of people yeah. and you can fix them you can get yep. spare parts for them yeah so yeah it, 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 it depends i think it really depends on the budget what you enjoy doing and you know whether or not there's a, a bit of an emotional attachment to stuff if, if like i say again if you had a hornet back in back in the day in the 80s you know you might want to relive that if you wanted to relive your youth for example you know you could go out and get a hornet and it's nice to know the options are there for sure yeah. and now you've got as much choice than ever really i mean it's like the second golden age of rc you know because of what happened with covid people had more time yeah. there was a big resurgence in it and now the amount of options and other companies have started to bring out other mm -hmm. uh, re-releases yeah. so yeah now's the time as well as all the other options the ready to run options yeah. that you've got you can pick from a whole load of manufacturers and you're going to be you know have a, you know going to be really happy with what you've purchased yeah definitely so i think moving on you, i mean looking again at all your amazing cars i think a lot of people want to know what is the most expensive thing in here you know and and why why is it so expensive it, that's a funny question because you could say what's the most expensive car yeah yeah or what's the most expensive thing yeah okay. relative to what it is right what i mean by that is 
how much would you pay for a set of tires <laughs> or how much would you pay for a set of stickers right okay yeah, so, yeah here we go you know like you can pay uh 130 pound for a set of original stickers yeah, yeah. which sounds quite crazy when it's a stick or decal whatever you want yeah, to call it yeah same for a set of tires it's just a little bit of rubber yeah and you'll spend 80 pound for a set of vintage mm. tires yeah. so there's that aspect uh, and that is a rabbit hole that you go down as you yeah. start getting into the vintage stuff. And each car has its own quirks and things of what's hard to find uh, and that kind of stuff. As a car in whole, yeah. there was two cars. One I sold, unfortunately. One was a 10th Technology X10, okay, which is a Predator. Now, that was a racing car from back in the day that is beautifully made. And it's amazing to drive. They were quite rare. It was an English company, and they've no, there's no re rees They're not bringing out any more, and those cars demand crazy money. And I sold mine uh, to another YouTuber. He made me an offer I couldn't refuse, so I had to let it go. <laughs> I tried to buy another one, and I had to send it back because it was just... Because they're so hard to find and they're so valuable, people do parts cars, mm -hmm. and then you're paying big money for a part car that's yep. not quite right. Yeah. So that, that is a car that went, went out of my uh, collection that I really wish I could keep it, but I couldn't take that. It was such a lovely offer. Yeah, yeah. So that's now with another YouTuber. The car that in my collection that I love the most, but is also the most hardest to find, I guess, is this one, which is a short wheelbase or standard wheelbase, whatever you want to call it. That is a Schumacher Cat. That is a beauty. Yeah, so this is an original because they didn't re-release them. This is in beautiful condition. Took me two years to find this one, um, and I absolutely adore it. But for people that know uh, Schumacher racing buggies, they actually re-released the XLS version of this, which was the long wheelbase one. Right, I see. They've discontinued it, and prices on those have now soared. But these are so hard to find because they were driven and destroyed and they were highly modified. People had these and then they made them into an XLS. So to find an original one with original chassis that isn't messed with is almost impossible to find. And I've only seen about three or four of these come up over the last three or four years. And I'm just noticing this is this has a short wheelbase, doesn't it? So how does this how does this perform when it comes to handling then? Because it's, it's horrifically hard to drive. <laughs> I was it looks it. It looks it's, it. It's almost square looking. Yeah. It's, it's got a very short wheelbase on it, which was the whole story behind why they did the XLS because it was so difficult to drive. The XLS is the same but longer with longer, the wheelbase. Yeah. So it means it would is much easier to handle, but incredibly fast in the one percent hands. Um, the reason I have such an attachment to it, not only is it, it's it's my favourite looking car, as well as the XLS is kind of the same but longer, but my friend had one, and he had one in Camel. Right, so yeah. So I yeah. have that connection to my part. And I remember when I, I was driving a Grasshopper, and he had this. This was like another world. And it's got some really weird things, like it's got crashback system. Oh, yeah. So if you I've never it, seen that before. Yeah. So that if you, you smash into stuff, it doesn't damage the front, which is uh, Cecil Schumacher is the guy who designed it. Um, so it had some really unique features and it obviously it went on with Masami to win world championships on the XLS one not the short world race one so it's it's a very pedigree car very rare gorgeous looking and I've got a connection to the past but uh, now if you tried to buy one of these you'd be looking at well over a thousand pound um, for, for, a, for a sorted one new in box don't exist I couldn't tell you what a new in box one costs because I've never seen one uh, gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, it has to be yeah. said, it is a very good looking car. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. This one wasn't restored by me, this was restored by somebody else. It's dry, the whole that's why it's it's got no oil in the shocks, it's got it's totally dry. It's it's a shelf queen piece. Yeah, that's something you're never gonna drive really, is it? No. You know, that I'd is I'd love to drive it. Yeah, yeah. I drive the XLS that I have. So is there anything that you're really excited about? Any new upcoming releases, anything like that? Well, being an old vintage collecting kind of guy, there is a whole back catalogue that we all wish that we could have. So obviously, we always, you know, you can't please everyone all the time, mm. but there's loads of cars that we really would love to see. There's the classics, the Falcon that I had before, whether we'll ever see that again, that's a big car. The King Cab is a very well-loved monster truck kind of thing. People really want to see that, and we haven't had a re-re of that. The Porsche that we had earlier on, the 955, is probably right up there. Yep. The Blazing Blazer, that's a highly desirable one. So there's there's sort of 10 really 
cars that people are desperate to see. Yeah. But then also, uh, Tamiya have just announced a BBX, which is completely left. I've built. seen that. It's a buggy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. This is old school Tamiya meets new. So it's like a kit that came out in the 80s and 90s, but it's brand new. Right. So this, I think, is a brilliant move for Tamiya because they're kind of ticking all their boxes. Yeah. Not only does it kind of cater for all the vintage fans that love the old sort of sand buggy yeah. style, but also it's brand new. And then it has the, the artwork on the box is really old school. Mm. So you would think it was a re-release, but actually it's a new. It's brand new. Yeah. Brand new. So again, that is, and there's a lot of buzz. And all I've ever got back from people that watch the show is positive vibes about that one. So I think they're really going to get some big success on, on the... On are the you cars. getting one of those? Oh, yeah, of course. You get... <laughs> of course you are. Yeah. Of course you are. So what about if I said to you, what are your top five Tamiya's of all time, your Tamiya cars? What would be your top five, your choices? Uh, if it was just the Tamiya I was going to go with, I would say uh, the Holy Grail would be the Porsche 959. Yep. A re-release exactly like it was Obviously, you can't do the livery, yeah. but just uh, what we call like a street, which is just a white version. But it has to be exactly the same chassis, exactly the same car. They need to change the plastics because it was it was a very weak chassis, so it broke all the time. But with modern composite plastics, it would be better that they went down that road mm -hmm. than to take the body that we know and love and put it on a different chassis. Right. If they did that, I think it would be blue murder because yeah. <laughs> uh, no one wants to see that. No, no. So on the original chassis, but with more modern plastics, because people can experience building it and driving them, and you can't drive them. Yeah. So that would be my number one. Uh, number two would be King Cab. I've actually got a King Cab that I've almost finished restoring. Mm -hmm. They drive brilliantly, but they're very rare, very hard to get hold of. The tires are ridiculously expensive. Um, one of those that would sell instantly. Uh, number three, what would be another one that would be a big success? Oh, we've had so many good reries now. So we've ticked off a few. Like I would have said the Top Force Evo, but they actually reread that. That was brilliant. That was last year or the year before. Uh, what else? There's a few other manufacturers I'd like to see. Uh, Schumacher do the Cougar 2, right. which I've actually got. I'm hoping, hopefully, that will happen. They just uh, produced, uh, they had the Cougar out. So hopefully that will come. Um, I would say the short wheelbase again would be nice because it would be nice to actually have and drive one, but then that makes it really, really special. Yeah. So I, on that side, um, a few more team associates associated, uh, re-releases. They actually did some, that's a re-release there of a world car. They, unfortunately they brought out the world car re-releases before the market really became what it is. So they've stopped doing them which is crazy because now the re-releases are the same value as the original ones because they don't make them, right. which is a whole weird, weird thing. So they've got lots of different uh, RC10s that they could re-release. Um, that would be brilliant. So any of those would be an instant success as well. So it's not just Tamiya. Not just Tamiya, no. And I was, obviously we haven't covered it much, but you, you do collect some other cars as well. We've got yeah. some Losi stuff up there and Team Associated. So it's not only Tamiya. You, what do you reckon? You're fifty percent Tamiya here and on this channel. And... Yeah, yeah, probably. People think of me mainly as Tamiya, as I do do a lot of Tamiya. But I am a big Kyosho fan. I do a lot of the Kyosho stuff. They're doing a lot of re-releases, which are really, really good. Um, they actually brought out the mid last year, which is this one here, which was a massive release for them. Um, hopefully, we'll see more releases from them. Um, there's some very rare ones. That's a very rare Tom's. Turbo Optimum Mid Special, which was uh, uh, when it came out originally, there was only two per store. Wow. So that's very rare. Very so rare. hopefully we'll get the, it's the same family. Yep. So they've got a whole back catalogue as well. And I know a lot of people would love to see the long wheelbase mids, which is this one. So um, that's that would be really, really epic to see. And I'm pretty sure we will see those. But really, I would love to see uh, RC10s come back because they, they kind of said they're not doing any more, which is a real shame because they are. They would sell out instantly if, if they came out again because the, they're so expensive. They're so hard to collect now. That is a bit of a shame. Yeah, that's the one of the big problems with uh, vintage RC now is that the prices are so expensive, you can't drive them because they're just too valuable. And if you break an arm, you can't find one. Yeah. yeah. So and, and cars get trapped in boxes because you have the box collectors that collect a car and they'll never build it because yeah. the minute you build it, you lose too much money. Yeah. So you've actually got cars that you can't build. 
which is why like when I did my blazing blazer, I built it because I was gifted it. Yeah. If I bought it, I would have lost over a fifteen hundred pound huge amount building of it. Yeah. But then I think part of it is the experience of building it. Like to say that I built a blazing blazer, there's hardly anyone because no one builds them they just yeah. keep them in the boxes so it's great that all these things become more valuable and stuff but it kind of defeats a lot of the the aspect of people can't afford to own it and if you remember back in the day when you were young yeah. you saw it in the shop and you're like oh, i would love that mm. can't afford it and then skip forward to now and it's like i can't afford it yeah and you, you know and so that's <laughs> that's a real shame you know, especially if you're after a vintage buggy and it's eight, nine hundred pound, it's quite hard to it's, justify. It's still out of reach. It's, it's, anything, so yeah, it's become yeah, more and yeah, more out of reach more more every out of reach. every year. Whether it it will plateau or whether it will go down again depends, because obviously you know there's a cost of living crisis. Mm, so mm. justifying an RC yeah. buggy, I'm going to spend eight hundred pound on an RC that I probably won't drive. Yeah. So I I kind of did a video on do I think prices are going to come down. Um. But uh, yeah, it's a bit of a rabbit hole. <laughs> Definitely is. I think that's sorry, we went a bit off. I think <laughs> we did a little bit, yeah. I but I think we had we had to put that in there because yeah. um, we have to we have to you know it's not only Tamiya's that no. you specialise in. There are a lot of different cars that you do enjoy mm. and you do like to collect. Yeah. So we definitely have to. Yeah, have I, to have throw a, it in. I have. I own an X Max. Yeah, I've yeah. Got of course, arm, yeah. I've got armors. You know, I've got different cars for different things. Yeah. You know, I don't take these out and blast them around the garden. No, no, no. But I have my ready to run stuff that I, I drive in the garden that's covered in mud. It just depends. Different things, different things. You know? Yeah, yeah. So obviously you do this pretty much full time now. This is your full time job. Do you have any advice for people who maybe want to start a YouTube channel or any YouTube advice in general, to be fair? Uh, yes, I gave up a perfectly good job to do this for a living, which is kind of a hobby. Um, advice. It's not as easy as you think. No, it's, and I can agree with that one. I think it's you, really not that easy. Yeah, I think if you talk to any YouTuber who does it at least part-time, mm. it's not a case of, oh, I'll bang out three videos and then I'll have a million subscribers. Yeah. Uh, and you do see a trend of people that decide they want to do YouTubing. Mm. They put out five or six videos. They start to get a feel of how much mm. effort, time and money it costs. And then they get... 30 subscribers yeah. so the return on your investment is very low when you start out yeah and it's an, it wears you down when you're smaller mm. so most people will fizzle out quite quickly so a channel will come it will grow maybe to a thousand and then it the videos last video was six months six ago, months ago yep. and that's you've got to be constantly active talking to people who view your stuff commenting putting out new content so there's a lot more to it. So yeah. it's if you're looking for a get rich quick scheme, it's definitely this is not the, the right completely way. opposite yeah. other end. Um, even though my channel now, I could easily earn more money working at McDonald's. Yeah, yeah, uh, and working less hours. But if you have passion for it yeah. and you love what you're doing and you want to work for yourself. Yeah. And uh, I don't have the Monday morning feeling. Yeah. I don't have that because I work every day. <laughs> but, but it's it's not a chore, is it? No. You know, it's it's no. enjoyment. It's yeah. like you say, it's a passion for you. Yeah. So. It's very hard if you're you've got a full time job paying the bills and then you want to become a YouTuber. Yeah. Because it's got so high, the, uh, hard the, the the bar of entry is harder all the time. So you the amount of effort you have to put in to quality of material. Uh, what you're producing is harder all the time yeah so if you're doing a full-time job and you've got a family and you want to be a youtuber mm. it's it's really really difficult to do it really is and i don't know about you but i've had some people leave comments you know oh i'd, I'd love for you know such and such company to send me a free car and how do you get all these free cars and you know it's really not that simple <laughs> no. is it you know it's no. not a simple case of email in a company and getting them to send you a car and, and you know you do, you do an eight minute video and that's pretty much it there's a way more to it than that and to, and to qualify to be able to get you know this free stuff sent to you as well it's really not as simple as people might think 100 percent. yeah and this if you actually break it down and you can work out okay our, a company will send you a free car mm. car has a value of 200 pound so you have to make maybe two videos on that. So two videos, it will take you a day to shoot, day to edit, release. So two days per video. So that's four days work for yeah. £200. So you've given four days work for £200. Then you've driven and used the RC. So mm -hmm. you want to sell it on. So the value is half. Yep. 
then you're if you're small what you're actually making per video is like 20 pound a video mm. You can soon work out that, oh, you got a free RC, mm. but you you didn't. <laughs> you just worked four days for it yeah. and probably made about £100. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure anybody and all your viewers would be like, oh, come and work for four days and I'll give you £100. <laughs> it's never going to happen. Never going to happen. It's never going to happen. So obviously there's this big, you know, people watch big YouTubers. And yes, you can make a lot of money when yeah. you've got four million subscribers yeah. and you, you get 300000 per video. Mm. But that's ninety five percent of the RC channels are not that. They're small, hardworking people that just love what they do and they keep grinding away. Yeah. And so, would you say that's the best advice? Just keep going, keep grinding, and eventually it may just sort of work out. I know for me especially, I started during COVID uh, when COVID was pretty much you know in full force, and I think a lot of people were at home. And I've always I'd always enjoyed RC anyway. So for me, it just sort of everything sort of worked out and it you know sort of slotted together perfectly and i feel like if it wasn't for covid i probably wouldn't be on a you know twenty thousand plus subscriber yeah. channel now i think i was fairly lucky to a certain extent but you started before all of that didn't you you started about four years ago now yeah. and i can imagine even back then it was incredibly hard to try and you know bearing in mind there's already much larger channels out there you find you have to try and justify uh, justify yourself a lot of the time and you have to try and be a little bit different otherwise you're essentially doing exactly what the other channels are doing and it's it's really not an easy thing to get into is it you know youtube as a whole very, very this, much so. you i mean what's your budget you, if you're trying to compete with someone who has a uh, 500 pound a video mm -hmm. budget or how are you going to if you try to emulate that you won't have money for very long. You'll mm. just go bust mm. because you can't compete on that level. So you've got to kind of find your own niche of what, what you like, but also get your, it's how you come across about your passion for it, yeah. that you're interested in it uh, and, and that kind of stuff. And yes, you've got to grind away at it, but I think you've got to constantly review your, your material mm. and not just go, okay, I'm doing that. You've got to improve. It, I think it needs to be what the audience want, want to see. You, you have to cater to your audience, don't you? Yeah. I mean, you I'm know? terrible for not doing that. I tend to do stuff that I like mm. and I could do other things that were more, uh, people would like to see more. Yeah. So it's a balancing act of doing what you love mm. and then trying to get it that there's enough people that want to watch it. Um, so it's, it's a challenge, but I wouldn't go back. I, I, I don't think it's impossible. You know, it's, yeah. it's not impossible. If you want to do it, you can, but just be prepared. You know, the hard work involved, the investment as well. You're going to have to yeah. pour some money into it. Yeah, and it's, it's really not as easy as people may think. Yeah. yeah. You know, if you're buying an RC car that costs £200 and then you're getting £10 back from the viewing of it, well, that's not a business model. No. So yeah, you you've got to, it's got to be half passion. Then you've also got to try and have enough resilience to keep going to get to the other side. Yeah. But uh, it's yeah, I wouldn't change it for the world, but it's not for everyone. No, of course not. <laughs> so what's next for you then? Because um, you know, you've been going for years. Things are going really well. You've just tipped the thirty thousand subscriber mark. What's what's next for you and your channel then? Um, the big one for me is obviously growing at a faster rate yeah because it's not okay most people who put the effort in will get to 100,000 subscribers mm. but if it takes 10 years that's an issue for yeah. you so it's growing faster um i do notice a trend as you the, the bigger you grow then you do grow a bit faster yeah. and you yeah. get a little bit more traction mm. so it does as the years go on year three year four i mean if you're looking at starting a youtube channel and you're in year one that's probably the worst place to be. Year yeah, one. It is the worst you're place. You're putting in yeah. all this effort and infusion. You're getting very little back. And uh, my first <laughs> month, I got 65 subscribers in my first month. Yeah. Now I'll probably get that in a day and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's very uh, relentless. when you're The smaller you are, I have a lot of time for anyone who has a small channel like 3,000. Yeah. Because they are grinding and working and getting 300 views and it's taken them two days yeah. to make it. Yeah. So yeah, my heart goes out to all the smaller YouTubers. Well, all I can say, today has definitely been a, uh, a great trip. You know, yeah. I've learned a lot today. I've had a look at some great, great cars, you know, and I don't think I've ever been in the presence of such amazing rc lot, cars. Lot There's a lot of old stuff. <laughs> I mean, some of these are older than me, so it is, it is a bit insane. But it's been great speaking to you, Gavin. Yeah. It really, it really has been great. It's been nice to pop down. Yeah. 
and uh, I think it was a long overdue collaboration <laughs> to be fair. Yeah. I've really enjoyed myself. Yeah, so thanks time. for having me. That's all right, nothing. It's been great fun. Thanks so much. So there we go then guys, a great day out today. Gavin's got some amazing cars in his collection. Now be sure to head over to his channel, check out some of his videos, especially if you're a Tamiya fan. And whilst you're there, don't forget to subscribe because he's gonna be releasing some really cool videos. I tell you what, today has been a lot of fun. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure you comment down below and let me know what you think. Cheers for watching, see you on the next one. Take care.